they're just innocently living their lives. They're kind of worried a little bit because everybody else is worried, but they're not grabbing paper and finding out what's going on. The second kind are those that are probably the biggest threat to what's going on today. These are folks that are ignorant. They don't really do any research. They don't know what's going on, but they have opinions because they heard something from here on a meme or a social media post or, or something they read over here, and they're just kind of blurted out on what's going on. Then the third kind are the irresponsible people. These are people that know what's going on, but they're not making the right responsible decisions. The fourth kind are those that are into conspiracy theories. Let me tell you, it's China. Let me tell you, it's this. Let me tell you, it's the U.S. government. Let me tell you, it's this, because it's more of a juicy story. They just want to kind of share. These are people that love gossip, and they want to share this stuff with other people. And the fifth kind are those that are the critical thinkers that don't want to listen to somebody talk and sensationalize what's going on. They want to do research, and they want to go see data, and they want to see what the experts are saying. Today, I'm sharing with you what these experts are talking about. So the goal is by the time you're done, you're living a busy life, you can say, okay, I kind of have an idea what's taking place with this. So let's go through the timeline, and everything I talk about, I'm going to leave the links below for you to go take a look at. First things first, on December 31st, China alerts WHO, which is a World Health Organization, of a flu-like case in Wuhan, right? We don't really know much about it right now, but at least they alerted them. On January 1st, Wuhan market identified as the outbreak hub. On January 5th, WHO, World Health Organization, advises against travel restrictions. Again, against, not for it. The same ones that said this is a pandemic advised against travel restrictions because they were not yet too worried about it. January 6th, SARS, MERS, and bird flu ruled out. January 11th, first death reported. 61-year-old man went to the hospital on the 27th of December. He thought he had flu. He ends up dying on January 11th. January 13th, first confirmed case outside of China in Thailand. January 17th, Second death, 69-year-old man from Wuhan. January 21st, U.S.'s first coronavirus case in Washington, 30-year-old man who traveled back from China. January 22nd, WHO declares international health emergency. Okay, now they're taking a little bit more seriously. January 23rd, China implements travel ban to and from Wuhan. Wuhan's a pretty big place, pretty big city. The whole Hubei community is around 50 million people. So that's a pretty big deal they announced right there. January 29th, death toll touches 132. 5,974 cases infected, right? January 30th, Russia closes 2,700-mile border to China. January 30th, Russia already said no one can come here from China. February 2nd, Trump announces travel ban to and from China. February 7th, Chinese whistleblower doctor who tried to issue early warning dies of coronavirus. Let me say this again. This doctor, he's worried that this could be bigger than what they think it is, but Chinese government is trying to prevent him. He's a whistleblower. He comes out and says, you guys got to be worried about this. The same doctor ends up dying. Death toll hits 638. February 11th, WHO gives name, coronavirus COVID-19. February 19th, death toll hits 2,000. February 22nd, Italy reports death. 78-year-old man, Iran reports two deaths. February 27, Iranian VP is officially testing positive for the coronavirus. February 29, U.S. officially reports the first death, and Trump announces travel ban to and from Iran. March 3, 3,000 death toll, WHO staff member test positive. This next one's very interesting. On March 3rd, Iran releases 54,000 prisoners to prevent spread of the virus. 54,000 prisoners. Go ahead, you're free. This is a way of us trying to prevent the virus because everybody's in prison together. March 9, Italian Prime Minister imposes countrywide lockdown. U.S. death toll hits 26. March 11th, this is a big day. WHO declares the outbreak a pandemic and Trump extends the travel ban to and from Europe. March 12th, Italy's death toll hits 1,000 in Italy. And Trump on March 13th declares national emergency. Death toll hits 5,500. Today, Cases, 173,000, death toll, 66, 64. By the time you watch this, this number's increasing. The date I'm shooting this is Monday, March 16th is the date today. So you can go back and look at the date. So if you see it on another, it's a higher today for you to know how, how fast it's escalating. So I'm showing this stuff to you. How bad has it gone with events? So many events have been canceled. South by Southwest, Ultra Music Festival, Miami, Boston Marathon, NBA, NHL, MLB, Masters, MLS, Coachella, Adobe, TED 2020, F8, which is the biggest Facebook conference of the year, GDC, which is a game developers conference, Shopify, Courts, Jury Duty. I can give you many. Apple shut down all their stores. So many different things that are taking place. I'm surprised the Olympics, Japan, hasn't yet made any announcement because what country in the next four or five months is going to feel comfortable sending their people to Olympics? Not many are. 
So this announcement's probably coming soon. You may watch us in May and say they've already announced it, and that's great because today's March 16th. Okay. So having said this, what what is the concern? What are, what are some of the biggest concerns that people are having? Because when you look at the cases of the 173,000, China's number one at 80,000, say 81,000. By the way, it's been slowing down a little bit. Italy's number two at 24,747 because they didn't get ahead of it. They kind of they didn't take it that seriously, and then boom, it's too late now. They have that many death toll. Iran's at 14,991. Spain's at 84, 8794. Then it's South Korea, Germany, France, U.S. Switzerland, then UK. By the way, Mexico only has 53 cases. That's why a lot of people are going to Mexico because it's one of the safest places to be today because coronavirus can't do anything to Mexicans as of today. Death toll by countries. China's number one at 3213, Italy 1809, Iran 853, Spain 297, France 127, South Korea 75, US 69, UK 35, Japan 27, Netherlands 20. Again, Mexico death toll zero. By the way, the most interesting number everybody's looking at is the following. South Korea has 8,236 cases and 75 deaths. U.S. has 3,802, half, more than half the cases, but only shy from South Korea by six. So why is that? What is South Korea? You'll see a data that we'll get through here for you to take a look at. But for those of you guys that are from U.S., this next data is for you to see where America's at by cases. Cases in America, number one is Washington. Then it's New York, then it's California, then Massachusetts, Florida, Colorado, Louisiana, Georgia, Illinois, and Jersey. And uh, death toll as far as state number one is Washington with 40. California, 22. Five of it's from a uh, cruise line that came in, uh, which would make it 27, but it's 22. California, Florida's at four, New York, two. Virginia, South Dakota, Jersey, Louisiana, Kansas, Georgia, Colorado, all at once. So I gave you the cases. I gave you the death. I give you an example of South Korea and where am I going with this. Here's one of the biggest concerns that people are having in America today because in America, hospital beds, we have a total of 924,100 hospital beds, okay, of which around 600 to 650 is being used, which means we have around 300,000 available beds, and that's concerning because what if this outbreak taking place and it goes so fast, we're in Italy, they don't have enough beds and enough respiratory machines to give to people, so they're choosing who to give it to. Don't give it to that old person. Give it to this young person. This person can live longer. That's what they're deciding between in Italy on what to do. And America doesn't want to get to that point because of hospital beds. So now, how do we measure hospital beds? The way we measure hospital beds is how many hospital beds a country has per thousand people. Watch this data here. Who's number one? Number one is Japan at 13.05 beds per thousand. Number two is South Korea, 12.27. Number three is Russia, 805. Then you got Germany at 8, Austria at 7.32, Hungary at 7.02, Czech Republic at 6.63, Poland 6.62, Lithuania 6.56, France at 5.98, and all the way somewhere in the bottom, U.S. is at 2.8. And by the way, Mexico is at 1.8, just to kind of give you some perspective, because if this thing spreads in Mexico, they're also not a good situation, but U.S. is at 2.8 bets per thousand. But first of all, I used to have a neighbor of mine that in my office in Northridge, his entire business was hospital beds. And he says, you have no idea how great business is. Anybody in the hospital bed business, American hospitals are giving them calls because they need beds today and they need them fast. So you sit there and you think about it. Well, how bad could this thing be? I mean, it really, when I'm looking at this, should I really be worried? The concern with this and why a lot of people, friends of mine on the inside, today's March 16, I got information from the inside that there may be a shutting down of any kind of domestic travel. Trump may be coming out and making that announcement or they may even have a full on lockdown for a week or two just to have this virus die out and not create any momentum. But I presume that a lot of travel coming in from Europe and Iran and any other country is probably going to be on lockdown for a long time until they slow down their cases. Even if U.S. slows down and takes control of the cases and other countries are not, don't expect travel to be open to a lot of other countries for quite some time unless if they get a hold of it as well, unless if they get a hold of it as well. But having said that, let's look at compound interest, rule of 72. Because if cases double at this pace, how bad could it be? Remember, just in January 29th, it was only 5,974 cases. That's only six weeks prior to today. It's 173,000 cases from 5,974. So how bad is this double effect? This is the way I did the math. I took it if the number of cases doubled every four days, six days, 10 days, how bad could it be in America? This is what it looks like. On February 4th, we had 11 cases in U.S. On February 11th, we had 14. On February 25th, we had 59. February 25th is only three weeks prior today. 
We had 29, uh, we had 50, now we're at 38.02 today, right? Now watch this. March 3rd, 125, from March 3rd to March 10th, it goes to 1,004, which is eight times. Then it goes to March 16th, 38.02. So I said, let's double these cases every four days, every six days, every 10 days. Let's see what it looks like. If you double the 4,000 cases every four days, March 20th, we're at 8,000. By April 17th, we'll crack a million. By May 2nd, we're at 16 million. By May 22nd, everyone in America has coronavirus, right? Now, here's just something to be thinking about. If this grows this way, if it's every six days, it's by June 30th, everyone in America has coronavirus. And if it's every 10 days, it's 9-14, everyone in America is going to have coronavirus. That is the big concern that they have on how quickly it can spread. That's why they're making some of the big decisions that they're making today. So now, the, the biggest data when I saw this, my mind automatically went to is how infectious is this disease and how deadly is it compared to some other diseases out there. This is what it's looking like when it comes down to infectious. The number they look at is R0, which is a reproduction number, meaning per person that gets it, how many people can they give this virus to? And where does COVID rank, coronavirus rank against others? Measles is number one. If you get it, on average, 12 to 18 people will get it. Smallpox, 5 to 7. Polio, 5 to 7. AIDS is 2 to 5. SARS is 2 to 5. And by the way, some of these is through sexual. Some of them is through air. Some of them is through saliva, spit. Some of them is through touching things. It's different met methods of getting the disease, but it's some data that I'm giving you here. SARS is 2 to 5. Coronavirus is 1.4 to 3.9, which means when you get it, you can give it to 1.4 to 3.9. Influenza is 2 to 3. Ebola is 1.5 to 2.5. And MERS is 0.3 to 0.8. If you do get it, how many people you can give it to? So that's the data of how infectious it is. How deadly it is, number one was Ebola at 50%. Number two is MERS at 34.4%. Number three is smallpox, 30%. Number four is SARS at 9.6%. Number five is COVID, coronavirus, at 1%. It's still 10 times worse than seasonal flu, but it's still 1%. So out of 100 people that get it, one person dies. Now, obviously, they're talking about the data that if you're older, it's worse. But I'm giving you data that out of 100, one person dies with this. So look, what does all this stuff mean to you? I, I got 10 names I want you to follow of experts. These are former CDC directors. Uh, th this is Anthony Fauci, who's the head of National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at the Institute of Health. I got, I got top 10 names I want you to follow. I'll put the link in the uh, uh, website that I want to send you. We just click on them and follow them. Uh, follow experts. Don't follow people that are journalists who need another story to sensationalize and put fear in you because they need you to go out there and watch them regularly so they, they're able to get more advertising dollars. These guys don't have to sell you anything. They're just telling you the facts. These are good people to follow. So what does this mean to you? What does this mean to you and I? I did a uh, webinar yesterday, and the way I started the webinar, everybody was wondering what's going on. I, I said there's three things you and I need to be thinking about right now. Number one is health. Number two is finance. Number three is replacing your income. Let me explain number one is health. When it comes down to health, you have to be thinking about elder, elderly parents, peers and siblings, spouse, then kids, then your friends where you're working at. Elderly parents, grandparents, Peers, brothers, siblings, spouse, kids, right? So when it comes down to that, you need to be doing your own research on how to prepare for it, how to wash your hands. Teach your kids how to wash your hands. Teach your family how to wash your hands. How to get your Im immune system to be stronger because if your immune system is stronger, you're in a better place. What to not touch, what to, all of these things. You need to have a serious kind of like a state of the union type of a thing with your family. That's what you need to be doing. Not with everybody, with your own family, have that conversation. That's number one is health. Number two is uh, finances. Look. You know, the reality is there's a few things going on today. I remember in 2000, I've been in the financial industry since 2001, uh, when 9-11 happened as a Series 7 broker, 66, 30, all those licenses. And there's a big difference between a market crash in 01 and 08 and today. 01, no one could have predicted it because it was two planes that flew into World Trade Center. And when that came down, it was war. You couldn't have said, on 9-11 at such and such time, 6.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. No, you couldn't have said that. It happened, we're shocked. Wait a minute, what just happened? Brought the entire country together, right? Then in 2008, greed got the best of everybody because it's kind of all the, this, this is gonna be like this forever and no income, no assets, and you can buy real estate. I'm gonna be a millionaire, I'm gonna be worth 50 million, 100 million. No, I don't believe this stuff. No, China's always gonna buy the paper on the back and we're gonna be okay. That was greed. So the first one was surprise. The second one was greed. This one, you can prepare for. This is more like a hurricane. This is not something that you couldn't be prepared for. This is a hurricane. The data tells you it's coming. 
So the way you react to it protects your finances. So for instance, in 08, we had people that had their 401k, $700,000, it dropped to $350,000. Market tank 38% in a year. And it was like, wow, well, I'm still gonna stay one more day, one more day, one more day. Market's going down. Depending on the age you are, you have to look at the way you've allocated your funds. You have to look at the way your parents have allocated their funds, and you have to look at the way your grandparents have allocated their funds and how much equities they have today because maybe somebody above 60 shouldn't be in equities as much as they are today because this is not going away in the next week. This is not going away in the next two weeks. This is probably going to be going on for the next four, eight, 16 weeks. Look, this is the data we have today. All this data could be changing tomorrow. It could get worse, it could get better, it could get all that, but you have to be prepared for worst case scenario and you have to anticipate, you have to prepare and you have to execute your strategy and be nimble enough to make any kind of adjustments if numbers change. So number one is health, number two is finance, number three is replacing an income. There are a lot of people that are getting fired today and many more will be. There are many, many people that are gonna get fired over the next two, four, eight weeks because companies are gonna sit there and say, we simply don't need people like airlines. If, if airlines shut down for four weeks, what are, the, what are they going to be doing? What are pilots going to be doing? What are, what are they going to be doing? They can't go to another place and work. They have to be thinking about this. If you're working in a hotel, hotel's gonna, if you're working at Apple, Apple shut down. Apple's not going to just pay salary to everybody. You have to be thinking about what is going to be happening. And you, have to fig you still have to figure out a way to make money on your own. You know, Kai was saying something earlier today. He says, do you think this is going to cause us to get back to the point where you can only really realize, uh, rely on your own income. I said, that's how it's always been, but we've conditioned people to think they can rely on somebody else to support them as a government. People are gonna be forced to learn how to make money today. They're gonna be forced, and there's still opportunities out there, but you gotta be thinking about it. As far as investments and opportunities goes, if you're sitting on a lot of cash, the next four, eight, 16 weeks, baseball cards, real estate, you know, collectible cars, paintings, artifacts, you know, stocks in different industries, whether it's airlines, hotel management, so many different places today to have, if you've been disciplined enough to have cash, this is a great time for you, if you are. So health, finance, replacing your income. Now let's set that part aside. Let me give you the final thoughts here on how I'm processing it. We're in LA, and I'm in LA last week because I have a board meeting. And I go in with my wife and I take my kids because it's spring break for the kids. I said, we'll go there. I'm gonna visit offices like I always do. And then we'll do our board meeting on Monday, and we'll go to church, we'll visit family, we'll visit mom, grandpa, everybody, and then we'll come back. Great. We fly in. One of my main board members says, I can't fly out. Why not? I'm worried about coronavirus. Really? Yes. He's in, he's in his late 60s, early 70s. Totally understand. Totally get it. Then another board member coming in from Connecticut. I'm concerned. Why? If I come to L.A., my mom and dad are going to get ticked if I don't go visit them. And if I visit them, I don't want to give them something. I got my immune system can handle it, but these guys are in their 80s. They can't. I get it. No problem. But I'm in LA, and I'm staying at Beverly Hilton, okay? And I'm sitting there saying, okay, what are we gonna be doing? I said, babe, uh, we were planning on going to Universal Studios and visiting friends and family there. We're not gonna be doing that. Parks are shutting down, Disney, Disney World. This, all, Universal Studios probably next, so we have to go back to Dallas. We don't need to stay here. And it's raining, pouring. She's like, you wanna tell the kids? I said, yeah. I said, Tico, Dylan, Santa, I gotta talk to you guys. And they come in, they're like all seriously lined up like this, you know? And I said, uh, look, we're not going to Universal Studios today. What? Yeah, we're not going to, why not? I said, there's a virus going around called coronavirus, and we haven't yet found a solution for it. You know how sometimes you have a headache or you have a pain or an itch, and we put some ointment or something that goes away? Yeah, they don't yet have the solution for this, and once they figure it out, things are gonna go back to normal, and then we'll see what happens. So my oldest son is like, you know, uh, Dad, do you think we can come up with a solution for coronavirus? Because what if we mix these two different medicines? His brain goes to automatically trying to, he, he just thinks that way, right? And then after some conversation, they accepted the fact. I said, if coronavirus, uh, we find a vaccine, can we come back to Universal? I said, of course we can come back. Awesome, great. Can we go watch a movie? They want to watch a movie. So then I called my mom, I called my dad. I gave everybody the information on how to be prepared because that's what you're supposed to be doing. Then we came back to Dallas. But I told my wife on a flight back, I said, babe, what is the only way this is going to slow down? What is the only way this is going to slow down? So we came back. The first thing I did Saturday, I got in, I came to the office. Early in the morning, I was at the office. I spent seven, eight, nine hours just researching. Over, I left the office at 7.30 on Saturday night, 8, 8 o'clock on Saturday night. I was here all day. So I pulled up all this data. I was worried about how infectious it is. I was worried about how deadly it is. I was worried about the hospital beds. I'm kind of looking at how it's going to be for doubles and how we need to be prepared for it. But I told my wife, I said, babe, here's probably the best thing we need to be thinking about. What's that? We have to accept the fact that many people are going to get coronavirus. 
could be somebody in our family, could be some of our friends, could be some of our coworkers. The odds are people are going to get it because if these cases go into millions, if it's at 173 and it was at 5,600 just a couple months ago, just a few weeks ago, this thing's going to go into millions in no time. And we just have to accept it's kind of like, well, people have this and people have that. And then from there, you have to study people that are on quarantine that are going through recovery mode and we have to see what they're doing. They're going to give us data and intel. And when we get that data and intel, because they're saying right now it's going to take 18 months to get a vaccine for this. Some are saying, Faust, you already found something, but nobody knows because every day we're learning new things about this. I said, but I'm relying on innovators and problem solvers and entrepreneurs to fix this. When Trump got up and he announced and he says, Google's here, CVS is here, Walmart's here. That's all the entrepreneurs that are coming to get a figure out a way to solve this problem. Because I've told you for many, many years, entrepreneurs are going to solve world's problems. And I've told you, cash is king and today's times validates both. Even the administration is re leaning on innovators to find a solution for this. And they're getting the scientists and the brilliant minds to see what can we do about this kind of stuff. But in every single bad time you and I have been a part of, when I was in Iran, we're getting bombed on. In one moment it was bad. It was just like, it seems like 15 of them hit in a span of five minutes. And you were just hearing all these. And we're under the stairs. We're hiding here. It's a four-story building. We're under the stairs because this is metal. Every time the buildings would come down, you would look. The, safe, the place that would always stay is under the stairs all the way at the bottom. So we're hiding there, me, my mom, my dad, my sister. And here's what I did. As a six-year-old, I remember till today. I look up on my dad, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, how come he's not worried? Not crying? Not, my mom's crying, my sister. I'm, I'm, we're, 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 man, if the man of the household is not worried, huh, maybe I shouldn't be. And we thought we're going to die. And we can control anything. We went to Karaj, bomb, Rash, bomb, Bandar Palavi, Rash. Every city we went to, they were bombing. So it's not like, it, it's a surprise attack, right? It's like 9-11. But I looked at him, and he gave me strength. Fast forward 35 years later, I remember that. As a 41-year-old with three kids and a wife and a family and two companies I'm running, I'm thinking about that moment. So for you, what does this mean to you? I don't know why it is. Crisis tends to give birth to new leaders. I don't know why it is. Crisis tends to give birth to new heroes and families. Everybody today is panicking. Many people are panicking today, whether they're the naive, the irresponsible, the ignorant, they're panicking today. But also every family, every community, every country, every city, every country, company has somebody that comes in with data and they bring strength and confidence with execution there. Those end up coming out of this and everyone leans on them as these are the leaders. So, this is a chance for you to be in your family a leader, in your company a leader, in your community a leader. A leader doesn't mean they don't do due diligence. A leader doesn't mean they're not looking at how serious it is. This is not a hoax. This is real. A part of a leader's responsibility is to go get the data for them so they can send it to people that are around them. So if you do that and things eventually end up getting better, we can look back and say, wow, man, we learned a lot from this. We can definitely no longer have 2.8 best per thousand. We can definitely not be, we can definitely, we have to be prepared for these times and we're gonna get smarter. So again, all the data I'm giving you is as of today, March 16th, things could change and if it requires me to do another video, I may do another video, but there's a couple things I want you to do. I promise you early on, 